So thanks very much for joining us. Um, Dave's going to talk for around 25 minutes. I'm going to talk for around 10 to 15 minutes. And then we'll have five to 10 minutes for um, questions at the end. If you've got any questions, please do feel free to type them into the chat function on GoToWebinar uh, panel, or um, feel free to tweet them to us using hashtag candidate ID. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dave. There we go. Hello, everybody. Cheers, Adam. Thanks very much for the, uh, the kind intro. And thank you very much for inviting me to the, the first Candidate ID webinar. So actually really excited. Um, thanks for coming along, everybody. And I'm really sorry about last week. I wasn't very well, but there you go. And I wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been able to make sense or, or hear anything I have to say. So uh, it's probably a good thing, to be honest. But uh, really excited uh, to have been invited here to talk about um, thinking like a marketeer and the whole impact around candidate experience and actually how you can understand, attract and engage uh, candidates as you move them through the funnel, which I know um, it's something that the, the guys and girls in candidate ID are really, really uh, passionate about. So let's get cracking. So in terms of uh, when we talk about candidate experience, we often we hear a lot about a candidate as a customer and a customer as a candidate and the same thing and all this kind of stuff and it's all you know we can we could actually have a whole separate webinar just on that subject alone. But actually, every time they touch your brand, every time they you communicate with them, whether it be digital, whether it be offline, whether it be just speaking to them, it's all part of the overall brand experience. And depending on whether you know them yet or you don't, or whether we would call them maybe a marketing the suspect and we want to turn them into prospects and turn them into customers, or in this case, you know, who are these candidates that we want to engage with and attract towards us? And then at what stage do they enter the funnel? Then how do we nurture them to be in our talent communities for talent for today or tomorrow? You know, that's something that we've we really do need to think about as a as a recruitment industry and also how how do we go about planning for that? How do we go about understanding those people? But every time we touch them in some way, it is part of an overall brand experience. But I'd actually I'd actually argue that in this world, in the world of recruitment, you get to know candidates more intimately than a brand would of their customers. Because if you think about what you do, you spend time getting to know them, you assess them, um, and you actually if you do it right, you give them good feedback, which actually is there to help them. So the whole journey that they have with you from the very beginning, top of funnel, some kind of stimulus, all the way through to they're working for you, that's all part of this brand experience. There's lots of different moments and moments in between moments that form part of this. Now, what's really interesting, is in particular, partnering partner up here with their candidate ID, is typically in the recruitment world, it's very technology driven in that we have these different pieces of technology, we then have our process and our recruitment process and the technology helps us manage that and then we go and then we're going to make candidates do these things. Now actually if we look at the consumer world and how we look to attract and engage customers, we really want to understand the customer first, we really want to understand their pain and pleasure points and their motivations and their routines and then we go right okay how are we then going to connect with them? How can we how can we get them excited? What sort of content can we put in front of them? How do we educate them about our products and our services? And then what's the technology that can help us enable to do that? Now unfortunately, normally in recruitment we do it the other way around. We go technology, process, people, but actually there's a shift going on, and this is something that the guys and girls the guys and girls at Canada ID very much so. We're seeing that it's actually they're starting to put marketing principles and the technology that we use in the consumer world into the recruitment space and helping us deliver best practice experiences in nurturing these candidates. So really exciting stuff. Um, and the, you know what 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 they're doing here with Candidate ID is really it's it's actually taking some of the stuff that's going in the consumer and the B2B world and actually 
you're helping us use technology in the right way to nurture people and to bring cannabis towards us. And something that, that we're really passionate about is that it's how we make people feel as they go through their journey with you as a brand. So people will forget what you said or did, but they may, they may never forget how you made them feel. It's a famous quote by Maya Ansulot, and it's really pertinent. Brand experience is delivered by feelings first, and then that creates thoughts and rational ideas of what people think about you towards you as a brand. And this is, you know, this is proven on and on and on. So this is about do we want to make candidates do something, or do we want, or are we trying to make them want to do it? And there's a subtle difference. It's not let's make them do this. It's how do we make them want to do it? How do we encourage them? How do we keep moving them through the funnel, through that pipeline, and get, and get them more and more engaged towards us as a talent brand and create that desire for uh, for recruitment and for talent to want to want to work with us. So this is a this is a, a model uh, called uh, the Google ZMOT, and it's known as the Zero Moment of Truth. And it's a study that Google did in 2012 to try and understand the journey that people go on, whether you're B to B, B to C, or in this case, candidate. What is the journey that you go on um, when you start considering a product or a service, or in this case, an organisation to go and work with? So we can see there on the left there's an initial stimulus. Something makes somebody go, hmm, am I going to go and check that out, or you know, what's that product like, or hmm, you know, what, what is that company like to work for, or that's interesting what they're writing about. And then there's this zero moment of truth, and that's when you pick up your phone, that's when you go to the desktop and you start researching. And incidentally, 63% of research online now starts on a phone, it's not a desktop. So we've gone past the point now where more people begin their research phase at zero moment of truth on their phone. So that's an interesting thing because people, even now people come to us and go, well, it's just like mobile friendly and there's the content, you know, can you read it on a, on a mobile device? You know, and, and should I have a mobile? So I was actually at a conference the other day and about 18% of people in the room didn't have a mobile responsive website, which I, which I found just quite incredible to be honest. So. Once they're at the zero moment of truth, the first moment of truth is when they buy the product or when they apply for the job. And the second moment of truth would be when they actually start using the product or once they've started the job. Now the ZMOT model in the recruitment world kind of looks like this. And the big bit in the middle is the research mode. And candidates on average will look at 14.5 sources of information. And they spend, we can see there, 72% of them spend between two and six hours researching the brand. Now, we're going to talk about funnels a little bit short and shortly, but this is top of funnel. This is where they're looking for information. Now, it might be looking for information of types of careers or jobs in a specific space, but it could be also looking for, well, what's it like to work at Google and is it stressful? stressful? And does this Google stone really exist when you go for the first month and they feed you loads of food? Basically, there's, there's so much food there, there's quite a famous thing that's known as Google stone. You have your first four weeks, you put a stone on. But I'm joking, but these are the sorts of things that our people are asking online and we can actually find this stuff out. And then if we can deliver great content with a great experience at these stages. We help move people from the zero moment of truth in the research mode, be it online, offline, word of mouth, through social channels, wherever it may be. And we move them towards the first moment of truth, which is that job application, which is obviously which is what we want. And then we can nurture them further and take them through the recruitment process, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But very much, you know, what, what we want to be thinking about is how do we understand this research mode? How do we understand the candidates? And how do we put the right content at the right time, the right information that helps them on their journey with us to move them towards the job application? So we want to design this process for happiness. We want to understand those moments and the moments between the moments and what goes on in the candidate persona's head so that we can put things in the right place that keeps them feeling happy towards us as a brand. And this idea of different moments is actually proven in neuroscience. So some of you who might be listening may have heard of the PepsiCo challenge. Now if you're getting on a little bit like me, you probably remember it was like in the 80s, it was like a blind test where they were given two separate drinks of cola and they basically said which one did they prefer. 
So they redid this test probably about four years ago now, and they got 200 people, and they had they were MRI scanning their brains, if you like, so they could see how their brains were lighting up when they were doing this. So they did the first test, and they, they didn't tell people what they were drinking, and they said, right, there's one can of cola, drink that, and there's another can of cola, drink that. And the test came out 50-50, so 50% of people chose Pepsi, and 50% of people chose Coke, said they preferred Coke, and 50% preferred Pepsi. So then they redid that test, and rather than it being a blind test, what they did is they told the people who were testing what they were going to drink before they actually tasted the drink. So they said, there's a can of Pepsi, drink that. There's a can of Coke, drink that. And basically, when they did that test, Coke won 80-20. So Coke now won 80% compared to Pepsi 20%, when the previous blind test was 50-50. And what happened is the parts of the brains that were lighting up in the two different tests was different. In the first test, the part of the brain that lit up was to do with uh, instant reward and gratification. And in the second test, the part of the brain that lit up even before they'd taken a sip of the drink was that based on memories and experiences. And the reason why Coke won, well, the reason why Coke won is because Coke are brilliant at delivering great content and experiences over time in different moments and moments between the moments and designing their whole brand for happiness and making us feel happy towards the brand. And what's happening is we've created subconscious thoughts towards their brand. And that is exactly what a brand experience is. It's different moments and creating experiences during those moments that are designed for happiness, and we do that with content. So the first first thing to think about is who is the consumer? So in this, this point, who is your target audience? And obviously it's candidates, but what are the candidates? Are they in HR? Are they in tech? Are they in marketing? And there's a famous guy uh, called David Ogilvy that you may have heard of, uh, and he has uh, an advertising agency called Ogilvy and Mather, the big, one of the biggest in the world, and he's, uh, his books are brilliant, by the way. If you ever get a chance to check out some of his books, they're superb. But he has a famous phrase, which is, the consumer isn't a moron, she is your wife. Now, what he's actually saying here is treat your customer, or in this case, treat your candidate as though you love them. Get to understand them, what do they like, what don't they like, you know, what, what motivates them. Treat them with trust. And treat them with respect and you will build that trust back. And it's really interesting because in the world of marketing, we're obsessed with persona mapping. Now, this is something, um, it's absolutely vital to get right if we really want to understand A, those that we want to connect with, but B, deliver great experiences and the right content and information to help them on their journey with us. So we do that through the world of CX, which is customer experience mapping, and part of that is persona mapping. So that would be the first thing to think about, is how do we build these personas? And they're basically archetypes that describe the goals and the behavior patterns of your potential audience. So imagine you're in a room, and there's, if, you know, there's a recruitment team there, you might have some of the hiring managers, and you say, okay, who is it recruiting for? Well, we're recruiting people in, uh, let's say, digital. Now, that might be UX UI people, that might be digital marketing people, that might be digital project managers. All of these people are specific personas. So if you take um, one of our clients, say, uh, Nationwide Build Society, we have eight different persona targets. We typically have four to six for our clients. Now they will have some, they'll have like the retail manager, they'll have someone in marketing, digital is a big space at the moment, everybody wants digital and tech, they'll have somebody in HR. Now if you think about it, if you walk into a pub and you were to speak to someone in digital and to speak to someone in HR, you would probably have different conversations. They might be different types of personalities, different motivations, different routines, different influence of people that influence them in different ways. So we need to build these archetypes of people first 
before we know what to say to them and how we can help them. And this is where sometimes in the world of talent, we jump in and we start, you know, just putting content out there without taking that step back and actually thinking about who these personas are. And in the world of digital, we still use good old sticky notes. So this is just an example um, of how we go about building personas here. We actually have like big Sabutio cutouts and we actually have a whole agenda, the question set um, that we use to build these up. Now actually, um, we're going to provide downloads to actual agenda with all the questions that will help you build uh, these personas up. It's an absolute, the number one step that we, we tell people to do. And what we're looking to find is the pain and pleasure points of those target personas. So the biggest motivators in life are pain and pleasure. And what we want to do is understand the pain of those personas. So, you know, different things like what do they go to bed morning about at night? What are the future challenges that might be going on in their professional lives? or in their world of technology, say, if it's, a, if it's a tech persona, what are the things that they're thinking about now? What are the things that they're thinking about in 12 months, in 24 months? What do they get frustrated with? How are they measured? You know, what, what measurements might there be in their roles or KPIs? What makes them look good? What can you do to help them make them look good? What makes their life easier? And by sort of covering these things, it then starts to shape your thinking about Okay, what are the types of things of content we can create that helps solve some of these pains or makes them think about the future and we can engage them with conversations and then this gives us great content to help us nurture those relationships and bring them towards us. So that's basic quick five minute round on personas and like I say we've we've got a um, We've got a download for you there that you can have, which will give you a whole agenda so you can do with your teams. The next thing is just to ask them. You know, something that go, we, we do a lot of is validation uh, and voice of the customer. So this would just simply be voice of the candidate. Well, ask them, you know, your recruiters, your teams, you're always speaking to candidates. What is it, you know, ask them what's, you know, what's going on in your world, you know, what's, um, what do you think is the biggest challenges facing you in the next 24 months, 12 months in the world of tech or HR, whatever it may be, you know, what are you really struggling with at the moment? And this will start to shape um, some of the potential opportunities to create content or to create conversations to help nurture you, nurture, help you nurture to candidates when they're in your uh, talent communities. And one of the things that we've actually done with some clients is we actually create a WhatsApp group and we say to recruiters, when you're speaking to candidates, if something comes up that you think is of interest, place it in the WhatsApp group and that becomes a central place to hold them and then weekly, monthly we can look at some of the topics that are in there and go, is this good content we could use that will help nurture candidates through the funnel or, or through ZMOT? So it's a really interesting way of doing it. And what I've got here is an example of a persona on the left. We've got a typical marketing funnel. So there's lots of different funnels in marketing. We have loads of them. Uh, the classic one is either, which will be top of funnel awareness as it moves down from the funnel of the awareness, interest, desire, action. This is this is a model uh, we've picked up. And uh, there's a guy called Avanish, it's a great blog, but he just calls it see, think, do, delight. So it's C, it's very much awareness level, how do we get that? Something that the, these guys, uh, Candid ID, can really, really help you with because it's all about nurturing. Move them into think, and then into do, and then delight. And what we can see on the right-hand side is the different types of questions that go on in personas' minds at different stages of the funnel. Now, this is quite interesting because we often challenge our clients to say, Hey, you know, what would be the top 100 questions that go on in your target persona's mind, and then how do we answer them? Okay, this is, I mean, it might not be 100, it might be 20, but it's kind of the thing that we use. And actually, there's so many extra benefits from trying to unearth these 100 questions. A, well, we can start answering them, and they can start finding brand lending content and bring them to us. B, it provides content that once they're in the talent communities and in those talent pipelines, we can start to nurture them, use marketing automation to put, them, to put the information in front of them, and it goes on and on and on. And also that content, if we use it from an SEO point of view in terms of visibility in Google, we start to answer questions that these candidates go looking for and searching for in Google, and over time, if it's done the right way, they will start to find us through organic search, so again, helping you attract them towards you. So that's 
that's really, really uh, important point is what are the top 100 questions and the different types of questions that go on in their minds as they go through the funnel. This is a great tool called answerthepublic.com. It's a free tool. Basically, what you, you can do here is, uh, and by the way, he's not my dad. Um, what you can do with this tool is you can type in any subject in, into it, and what it will do is it will pull out all the questions that go on inside of Google around that subject. So as you can see here, you probably can't see all the detail, but I've typed in in the middle there, recruitment. And it's come up with all the questions, the hows, the ahs, the where's, the which's, the who's, the what's, the when's, all the different questions that have been asked in Google in the last couple of months that are being asked, and that starts to show us Hey, look at all these questions. How can we answer these? Or how can we use our team or people we know or influencers we know or candidates or clients even that we know? And we can maybe interview them about these questions and start to use this content to help our talent communities and help our target personas with their pain and pleasure points. It's a great tool. Definitely go and check it out. The next thing is then walk in their shoes. So when was the last time, now you're armed with these questions and the things that candidates go looking for, when was the last time you actually pretended you were a candidate and you started you know, tapping away in Google, asking these questions, going into social channels, going into Instagram, Twitter, checking these things out, and what do you find? What's the experience like? Is it the information or is it being answered? Have you tried searching for it online on your phone? What does it look like? What does it feel like? Walking in your candidate shoes, armed with questions and information that they go looking for, and then actually do it yourself, will actually give you a feeling and then create thoughts on actually where's the opportunity for you there. This is what we call a CX journey map. So this is something that we did with Virgin Media. What's interesting here is is you can see the typical points of, of a process, of recruitment process. You've got attraction, you've got apply, you've got screen assessment and, and um, the result. But here, in this instance, we're focused more on the attraction phase. So it's not just about the questions, but what we'd also look at is how do they feel. So what's, how are they feeling when they start looking for this information? Because your goal is to make them continually feel positive and happy about what they're interacting with from a content point of view. And when we're nurturing them and sending them information and engaging with them, how are they feeling as you keep on doing that? How are you helping them? How are you making them think positively about you? But also ease. How easy is it for to find them? So then, like I've just said, walking in their shoes, when you go looking, as walking in the candidate's shoes, do they find what it is they're looking for and how easy is it for them to do what they want? I'm not going to go too much into that. We, we could do a whole webinar on CX journey mapping, but it is about feelings, how people feel, what they think, and then how easy is it at each stage. So in the attraction phase, what are they feeling, what are the questions, and what are they thinking, and then how easy is it for them, A, to find it, and then B, interact with it, and then C, for your point of view, how do we get them into that talent community so that you can begin to nurture them. Now, here's the thing about the world of recruitment, and it's a funny thing, because I often relate, and I often relate the world of recruitment to Marvelize and Gremlins. So if you haven't seen the film Gremlins, you need to go and check it out. I'm still amazed how many people haven't seen it. But in, in the world of marketing and in the world of recruitment especially, sometimes you know, we're like Gremlins, we get fed after midnight, we go a little bit crazy, and it's all about, you know, we've got to find somebody, and they've got to, we want to pass them, we love them, and we tend to forget about the people that fail. But, you know, in the world of marketing, you know, are we going for the are we going for the sort of the the quick win? And yes, there are quick wins, but we also need to consider how we keep turning the flywheel. We're making friends not just for today, but also for tomorrow. How do you keep adding value to that talent community? I don't quite like the word talent pools because if when people are left in a swimming pool, they typically tend to drown if we leave them for too long. So I like the word community, and I like the word, you know, it's all about how we build these relationships. So act like a mob wise sometimes, not always about being the gremlin. But think about how you add value and build trust with communities. But what we can see here is there are different ways of doing that. So across, if this is ZMOT here, they've got the ZMOT model here, or if this was top of funnel at the beginning, Inspiring and entertaining content 
often gets attention at awareness stage or the future of. Challenging the status quo, having an opinion on something can sometimes gain uh, engagement. Then as we move down the funnel or across this model, how can we educate people throughout education and entertainment works well together, but moving from inspiring, entertain, through to educate, and then as we further down the funnel, how do we convince them? How do we convince them to supply uh, to to uh, to apply? And then also, once they've applied, how do we continue to support them? And again, you know, once they're in the recruitment process, well, what contents have you got that can keep helping them? But as we can see there. There is a job to be done to nurture from initial st initial stimulus all the way through to application, even after application, and even when they start the job. You know, there's the whole onboarding process and ongoing and ongoing and ongoing. And if they don't quite get the job or they don't get past certain stages, how do you keep nurturing them anyway? Because they could be a candidate for the future, but they can also become a brand advocate, if you give great content, they can share that content into communities of people just like themselves and help you extend where your brand is. A couple of quick ways of, of some good uh, examples of how you can do this. The first thing is the power of storytelling. So in the world of community engagement, there's a science called homophily, and that basically is saying that birds of a feather, feather flock together, and it's that famous, famous saying now. A great way to do this is to think about the stories that you can tell as an organization that resonate with those communities. So if you're like me, you might be a bit of a Star Wars fan, I love a bit of Star Wars. And the simple model to this is Luke Skywalker is the reluctant hero, he's going on the hero's journey. He meets Obi-Wan, Obi-Wan Kenobi becomes his mentor, and he wants to give Luke the tools to the truck for the job to become a Jedi and save the galaxy. And he meets him and Luke's not sure and then something happens and his family dies and blah, blah, blah. Then he comes back to Obi-Wan and he says, I want to be a Jedi like my father and save the galaxy, blah, blah, blah. And Obi-Wan then mentors him, then he meets Yoda, he mentors him, he becomes a Jedi. And who knows, in the new film, I'm sure he's going to mentor Rey to become a Jedi. Now, take Star Wars, the brand, it's the same thing, but it's storytelling for brands the same thing. The candidate is Luke Skywalker, it's the reluctant hero, it's not quite sure. You, the brand, is the mentor, it's Obi-Wan Kenobi, and you need to give them the tools to help them move through the journey. And so what you need to do is think about, as the mentor, how do we help, how do we educate, and how do we nurture them along to become the wannabe hero? This is an example of a content playbook that we've done for Virgin Media. And what this is, is we create a framework and rules that are going to help us put the right content in the right manner at the right time of the funnel to help nurture candidates. So you can sort of see here we've got the how, the being, and the when, if you look in the panel, the, the window on the bottom left. So the how is... What are we going to do? As an organization, what is it we want to do? So we want to educate, we want to inspire, we want to support, we want to engage talent, target personas to help them. We're going to do this through how we're going to be while we do this. We're going to be open-minded, fun, and generous. That sits in with the brand values of Virgin Media, a part of their EVP. And the when is what stage of the funnel. So is it awareness? Is it convinced? Is it action? Is it delight? And we use that as a framework to come up with ideas to help us nurture talent communities. And we come okay. And that's that's that was Usain Bolt there, just jumping in. This is examples of content that we've created. So you can see. So it's it's how do we educate with with um, being fun? So the shake hands. So this is showing uh, graduates even youth level to about 24 year olds, Here's a, we've got a cool sort of interactive infographic and content about first impressions and part that is shaking hands. So that would be an example of how we've taken educate, there's a little bit of entertainment in there, and it's fun as an example. And then we have all these different content, content assets that go on to help us nurture these communities and keep them engaged and then help them bring them to apply for a job at Virgin Media. I wanted to put this in purely because what Candidate ID do is really, really clever in terms of marketing automation and lead 
scoring, if you like, a candidate lead scoring. So we use marketing automation software in the world of marketing for B2B a lot. And basically, we create a workflow which you can see at the different points there, one to five. And these are just different examples of, number one, offer, offer something that solves pain point one. Number two, send something that automatically then comes within a short space of time that encourages engagement. Number three, a few days after that, we've just been thinking about your message and so on and so on and so on. And what you can see is that each time a person interacts with what we send them, they get a score. Okay, and as the score builds, what we see on the right hand side is there's human interaction. So this is where we're using technology to enable human interaction at the right place at the right time as the score of somebody improves. And what kind of ID can do really well is help you build that profile based on the behavior of the candidates on your digital assets. It's really, really smart and it's really best practice from marketing. So it's definitely something that we need to be considering in the world of talent. So that's um, kind of it for me from now. I'm going to um, hand you back. We've got downloads and lots of um, Lots of information for you on all of that sort of stuff. It was a quick 25 minutes. Do you me speak before I can go on about this stuff forever? But I'm going to hand you back now. And um, hope you enjoyed it. And any questions, we'll, uh, we'll answer them at the end. Great. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, so it's Adam again here. I'm just going to, so first of all, I want to say that, uh, yeah, I mean, I, yet again, I agree with absolutely everything that Dave's just said. Um, and some of the things that I'm going to quickly talk about just now um, give a, a slightly alternative perspective, but it's, it, it's absolutely mirrors what, what, what Dave said. So the new candidate journey. Um, it's all changed. It's very exciting. We know from the parallels in the consumer world, some that Dave's just touched on, that marketing's got a much bigger role to play than it ever has in the past in terms of moving people down the pipeline, whether that's turning the public into consumers or, from our perspective, turning strangers into enthusiastic candidates. In this first flowchart, you can see that in the past, say 15 years ago or when I first started working in recruitment which was 18 years ago um, recruitment marketing could only really make candidates aware of an employer through advertising in newspapers trade magazines an employer could broadcast its opportunities but candidates couldn't really get more information than that on their own so if they wanted to educate themselves and find out more information they really needed to talk to a recruiter who would be able to tell them all about the opportunity, career progression, compensation and benefits, the office environment, and you know, other things that they wanted to know about. So this was great for recruitment consultants like me because it meant that I had the opportunity to influence candidates individually and at an early stage in their journey. In the second flow chart, you can see that everything's changed. Candidates can not only become aware of an opportunity, but they can self-educate, they can deeply consider one potential employer compared to others. And that's because Glassdoor, LinkedIn, and many other online resources have become so prominent and vital for candidates. Sadly, for recruitment consultants, that means that they don't have the opportunity to influence candidates at such an early stage in their decision. So candidates go through much more of that journey independently now, and they don't want to talk to anyone until they're ready. So by the time most candidates reveal themselves as being interested in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a recruiter, they've already made up their mind that they want to attend an interview and they want to consider a job offer from your organization. Think about it in terms of other life-changing decisions. So it's not quite the same as buying a can of Coke or Pepsi, but it is the same as um, other yeah, life-changing decisions, such as buying a new house. So if, for example, you're thinking about buying a new build home, you're going to visit far less show homes than you would have done 15 years ago when video walkarounds and other vital information just wasn't available online. So you had to turn up to the sites 
and you had to talk to sales consultants. However, the good news for a talent acquisition team now is that this new candidate journey presents recruitment marketing with a brilliant opportunity, and that is to directly give potential candidates the opportunity to become aware, to self-educate, to consider and make decisions using your content. So if potential candidates are going to go through these steps themselves, but they're utilizing the content that you want them to see, delivered straight into their inbox or straight to their news feeds, to their social media accounts, recruitment marketing can seriously influence where individual consultants no longer have the opportunity to do so. Why is that important? If we acknowledge that the candidate decision-making journey is mostly going on in the background out with your immediate visibility that means it's complex for recruiters to know who within your talent community to target incidentally i don't really like the term talent pool either um, so we know that many companies with millions of potential candidates on their applicant tracking systems but when the recruiters don't know who's actually at the awareness stage um, and who's like much closer to the end of the pipeline, so they're up at the consideration phase, that means if they don't know, they need to pick up the phone to everybody that they've got on their database. And that's not a sustainable approach. It's extremely time consuming and also therefore very expensive. However, if you had the insights into who was at which phase, that means that you could focus your time on talking only to those people in the consideration phase and before they've made a decision about who to apply to or not and whether that includes your organization. So if you know who to, who's in the consideration phase and specifically who's in this red shaded box who is about to make a decision on whether to apply to your business or not, and if your recruiters are spending all their time talking to those people, that's a really, really good use um, of their time. So um, that's you know, the optimum time for a human to achieve influence with a potential candidate is when they're in that red box. And that's why we created Candidate ID, to make that information possible. So um, our approach to recruitment, I'm, don't, I'm not expecting you to read everything that's on this slide. You'll get a copy of this after the, after the webinar. But um, our approach to recruitment is all about talent pipelines. And, and the reason why is because when you start every search from scratch, it's time consuming. So you need to talk to a lot of people if you're direct sourcing it to identify who's in the market and who isn't interested. Um, if it's not time consuming, then the alternative is it's expensive because you need to take reactive steps, what we might call making a distressed purchase. For example, advertising is costly. And although it's a positive part of your employer brand and you need to do some of it, certainly, if you rely on it for every shortlist, I think it's a bit like being addicted to heroin, which nobody probably wants. Um, so most employers do have a talent um, community or a talent database, whether that's just CVs and drawers, names and email addresses on spreadsheets, the hiring manager's LinkedIn connections and Twitter followers, people who follow your company page online. Yeah, if you can bring all of these details together in one place, that is that talent pipeline. Once you start to nurture these people with the kind of content that's useful and relevant and is aimed at people according to which stage they're at so that people who are in awareness are not getting job descriptions rammed down their throats and the people at consideration are not getting the touchy-feely, it'd be nice to know each other kind of content, they're actually getting, here's why you need to consider working at PepsiCo, then you've got a big, big advantage. So. The biggest benefits of taking this approach, they all lie within a talent acquisition team's main objectives, which for some it might be about reduced time to shortlist, some it might be about reduced time, time to uh, cost per hire, and some for some it might be purely about um, increasing quality of hire. And if you do this kind of stuff, you can impact on all of those. So just a bit more about the new candidate's journey. And again, Dave's kind of touched on these things as a slightly alternative um, version of it. Going a little deeper into this, we believe it's vital to create content which is useful and relevant for people at different stages. And for those who are only aware of you as a potential employer, as I mentioned, 
They don't want to see job specs. They want to just continue to generate a bit of goodwill from your business. You, if you're useful to them with, here's how to be a great uh, digital professional or web developer or whatever it might be, then that's great. You're building goodwill, but you're not getting too salesy, if you like, with them. So for those that are about to decide who to send their CV to or not, it's too late to start generating goodwill and telling them all about your corporate social responsibility. You need to have done that in advance. So for those who are aware but not ready for a career discussion, they might appreciate, say, a fortnightly update on the hot things going on in your industry, something like that. They might also appreciate a regular talent-focused update, which tells them about the top skills they need to get ahead in their career. For those that are starting to educate themselves on your organization, they'll want to know the reasons why they should be going further with you. So sending them more EVP-related material at that stage is going to be appropriate. And once they start to really show signs that they're in the market, that's when you should share with them how to create a brilliant CV, how to prepare for an interview, and that's when your recruiters need to know who these people are so that they can get primed to make direct contact with each potential candidate and roll the red carpet out to them. Now, just as part of this, I believe it is vital to put hiring managers into the middle of that talent attraction process, making them heroes, making them famous to the people that you want to hire, and segmenting according to Dave's uh, personas. With Nationwide, there's eight different personas. I believe one or maybe a couple of hiring managers that represents those different um, groups or is the hero to those different groups is a really, really good thing to do. So talent brand is it's a, it's a quite a new concept. It revolves around hiring managers. It's all about making them magnetic and compelling to potential candidates. Of course, social media has really given birth to this concept or it's really powered this concept. And we know that over two-thirds of potential candidates will review a hiring manager's profile online in advance of an interview. Now, that's a brilliant opportunity to seriously inspire them so that they're even better prepared and enthused about joining your business before they even turn up at your building. A couple of examples, and these are LinkedIn profiles, but obviously this applies to all social networks as well as blogs, webinars, anything else that your hiring managers can do to contribute to talent brand and, and, and make candidates excited about the opportunity to work for your organization. So here's one example. This is somebody I know, Bridget Hutchinson. Um, it's a great example of talent brand. She's used the wonderful Whitbread Values document at the top of her profile to show potential candidates what kind of culture they can expect and what they can expect from working at Whitbread. Sorry the resolution of the screenshot doesn't show all of that, but um, for a, a tablet, I think it's it's all totally visible. Now, the other thing is, if you look at the text, how she started her LinkedIn profile, I joined Whitbread for two reasons. The first was because of the people that I met. They lived and breathed the value and cultures of the business. The second was about the company and my role. It's an exciting business. She's explained clearly the two reasons why she joined Whitbread. There's nothing like hearing it from the horse's mouth. It's totally authentic. Um, here's an example of my own. It's just about um, including rich media so that interested candidates have got more reading that they can do if they're interested. More reading, more like videos. Everybody's got different preferences for digesting, um, digesting information. And if you've got something that appeals to everybody, so a lot of people like video, some people want to download something and read it on the train. Um, if you've got content in different formats, that's going to give um, candidates more information that's relevant to them. They don't, of course, have to read it, but for those that are really self-educating and really understanding, is this right for me? If you give them plenty, then they're not going to be left wondering, and they've got enough to decide if they're going to make contact. This is one of my favorite examples ever. Um, David Morgan is head of the employment law practice at a large law firm. He's got several one-minute videos on his profile on LinkedIn to explain his views on employment law and even why he decided to become an employment lawyer and his passion for employment law. When a candidate views this, 
in advance of turning up for an interview, not only do they know what he looks like, but they know what he sounds like, they know what he's personally interested in, and I believe this is a phenomenal example of talent brand being used to inspire potential candidates. So just before we go into questions, um, quick summary. So in the same way that our journey towards buying a new home, a new car, a wedding venue, or some other important life decision is maybe easier than it was in the past when we had to talk to a lot of people, for candidates, they can do so much more self-directing and it really is vital that you're catering to them. Linked to that, talent brand is so much more visible than it ever was in the past. So it's vital that you as talent acquisition teams are able to help hiring managers to be magnetic and look compelling online. As I mentioned, two out of, two out of three candidates will review a hiring manager's profile before they turn up for an interview. So they can find out so much more than they could in the past. So um, I hope that's been really uh, useful. I'm just going to take on a couple of questions. If you'd like to um, do that in chat, Dave, you are unmuted so that you can answer these questions. First question is, it was on Twitter, and it's from Ben Gledhill. And the question is, but it's really quite specific, do you think ATS will ever cease in its current form due to not being CX? <laughs> Hello, I know Ben. Hi, Ben. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a really, really good question. And uh, in short, the answer is they're going to have to change. They, you know, they'll have to change. I think it's really interesting times for tech in the, in the world of talent, because the, obviously there's just so much going on in the world of tech anyway. But I think ATS is, um, you know, traditionally there's, there's lots of huge organizations that have developed ATSs, and what happens is as we get bigger, as companies get bigger, they become less agile, and they have product roadmaps, especially in the world of tech, and, uh, to, to make changes. I think as I saw these talks, and I know Ben's very passionate about candidate experience. In fact, you should check out Ben on Twitter. It's uh, at Recruiter Guy Northwest. He's got this really good uh, candidate experience model. Everyone should go and check that out. Go and, uh, give him some feedback on that because he's put a lot of effort in there. It's a really, really good piece of work. But ATSs need to be much more focused on the user group that is the candidate, not the user group that is the business. And it's very, it's there to help recruiters manage the recruitment process. And obviously that's really, really important. But brands now, talent brands are, are, are really, really see the link between candidates, candidate experience, and the impact that they have on their brand experience and on their potential to be a customer or not going forward and an, an evangelist or someone who's basically gonna slide the brand off. So, and the ATS is part of that. Now, I don't know about you, but if, I, if you try applying for jobs online, or definitely through a phone, we're through a lot of ATSs, the experience isn't great. It's like almost having a checkout of ASOS or Amazon that has like a 10-page form to fill in, you can't do it on your phone, and blah, blah, blah. So yes, they're gonna have to change. The question is, is they probably have the ambition to change. It's probably about the speed at which they can change. And actually, I find that the, 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 the people, the startups, or the companies been doing it around for a couple of years, they're the ones that tend to be having a, their CX right. You know, I mean, like, like you know, you guys, Candidate ID, you know, you're, you're, you're obsessed with, you know, candidate experiencing and delivering the right experience, right moment, right time. ADSs, especially the bigger companies, are really starting to try and turn that around. But I guess the answer is how quickly can they do it, but in short, yes, I do believe they're going to have to change. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just going to add one thing to that, and that is that um, it, th this is just a fact. If you look at um, stock market flotations for tech SaaS companies, the companies that are getting by far the highest valuation are companies that are systems of engagement. So they're, they're built to inspire people. Whereas something like an applicant tracking system is a system of record, so it's built to store information and for internal workflow, and they have they absolutely have to change if they're going to become anything more than commodity. Um, 
One other good thing is I would check out um, online another guy called Josh Bersin, B-E-R-S-I-N, um, who is a real leader in this field and knows all about African tracking systems and how they need to change. So um, I suppose the final thing is just thank you for me. We only had one question, so hopefully that's because everybody else is um, really kind of speechless around all the different things that they need to go off and uh, do now. So, um, Dave, many, many thanks for your time. Everybody who's uh, dialed in, a large number of people have taken part. Thank you very much for your time. Um, this has been recorded, so happy to share the recording with anybody. Um, also happy to share the slides with people and uh, feel free to contact with me or with Dave independently if you've got any further questions about the content and look forward to um, talking to you again in a couple of months' time. So thanks very much.